Hello everyone and welcome back. <clears throat> now, in the previous two videos, I introduced you to a lot of the theory of symmetric dynamical systems analysis, and in particular, the equivariant branching lemma, the fundamental component of symmetric bifurcation theory. Now, a lot of these techniques were developed for ordinary differential equations, but really with partial differential equations in mind because that's really where physical symmetries manifest themselves in the most sort of interpretable and familiar ways. So what I would like to do in this video is give you a brief sketch of how these ideas carry over to partial differential equations. I'm not gonna go into full detail here because it's a very complicated area that requires a lot of Bonnock spaces and PDE theory, and frankly is still not finished. But nonetheless, I'm going to do it for a very particular type of equation, okay? I'm going to look at what are called reaction diffusion equations. Now, in my case, I'm going to look at a partial differential equations that look like this. Time derivative, check. We got a dynamical system, we're good. Second derivative in space. In this case, uh, I'm going to have u being a function of theta space and t time with, okay, so in my case, theta is going to belong to what I'll call omega, which is going to be the circle, okay? So, you know, this is just the circle. Okay, so I'm, I'm putting this thing on a periodic domain, if you'd like to think of it that way. Uh, sorry, this should be belongs to in and t is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so so one of the reasons I want to focus on this partial differential equation is because it's extremely well studied. We actually have a lot of results that give us um, that these things sort of behave or at least have similar properties to um, to ordinary differential equations or typically study dynamical systems. Uh, but the main reason I want to talk about this is because these are some of the most fundamental uh, partial differential equations that one would encounter in nature. Now that name, reaction diffusion equations, that comes from chemical reaction kinetics. So you could think about a chemical reaction in a petri dish. Well, the reaction part is the actual chemical reaction. That is captured in the reaction component of this differential equation, G of U and mu. You might have reaction parameters. This is saying, you know, how the state of the system reacts. And the diffusion part is the spatial component, the fact that the reaction can spread around in space. Now, typically what you expect here is a sort of you're, you're thinking about a sort of heat flow that's happening here. You're ha thinking about things spreading out. Now, reaction diffusion models are used for much more than chemical kinetics, right? We, they might be very easily derived in that way, but they're also pretty widely studied in things like spatial ecology, right? So animal movement, diffusion, that's the physical movement process. Reaction, these are birth-death processes, right? So at each point in space, you have birth-death processes, and then you're sort of moving around within that space. In my case, I'm just putting everything on the circle to make it simpler. It's a periodic domain. You can always just think of it as maybe like zero to two pi and it's periodic. Now, in this case, I gotta ask myself for fixed points, right? Anytime I start with the dynamical system, I start by asking myself, what are the fixed points? In this case, fixed points are going to be solutions to this ordinary differential equation. They don't change in time, so the time derivative becomes zero. These are periodic functions of the spatial variable theta. So equilibria, or fixed points in this case, are functions. That's a weird thing, right? So sometimes we would write this in like operator form. I'd like to maybe use the, the form P. And really we would say P U of mu is equal to zero. But the question is, what spaces should you live in, All right? So this is where Bonnock space theory starts coming in. So we would look at spaces of differentiable functions. I'm going to use C to the K of two pi 
This is k times continuously differentiable functions uh, that are and 2 pi periodic. And the 2 pi periodic here, sorry, this should be a 2 pi in front of this. The 2 pi periodic comes from the fact that I'm on a circle, right? So I have to go around. These things have to meet themselves whenever you go all the way back around the circle. And in this case, you can measure sort of distance in this, uh, in this space by looking at this norm, which is going to ask you what is the supremum of the original function over the domain, compact domain, right? So these things are continuous by the extreme value theorem. This is attained plus the supremum of the derivative. Again, extreme value theorem, it's attained, plus all the way up to the kth derivative. Okay, so this is how we measure the size of something in this space. Right, we ask how big is each one of the derivatives, in point-wise. And it turns out, then, that my operator P it's going to take twice differentiable functions. I need to have two derivatives. So it takes functions with two derivatives and it sends them to functions with no derivatives anymore. Right, because if you have two derivatives, you use them up on this piece right here. And so now you don't have any more derivatives, right? So this is a weird property. The domain and range of this thing are different. Usually it's like Rn. So we never have to worry, right? It's finite dimensional spaces. In this case, this is an infinite dimensional space and we go from the twice differentiable functions into the just continuous functions. So you can't, you know, this, this becomes a, a huge sticking point uh, whenever you're doing PDE theory, right? So this is one of the main technical hurdles for doing things like existence and uniqueness proofs or trying to uh, look at flows of these dynamical systems, right? So stability problems, all these kind of familiar things from uh, typical like ordinary differential equations. But you have a solution, right? Because you're going to tell me, Jason, I can overcome that. Why don't you just look at infinitely differentiable functions? Because if something's infinitely differentiable, its second derivative is also infinitely differentiable. Well, it turns out that the space of infinitely differentiable functions is not a Bonnock space, it's not a complete space, which again might be getting, you know, might be stretching the limits of your mathematical knowledge, but essentially, uh, it doesn't work, okay? So I just want you to see that things can be very, very different here. Um, but at the same time, things can be very much the same. So for example, what is the symmetry group of solutions to this partial differential equation? Is this operator P equivariant? And if it is equivariant, what group is it equivariant with respect to? Well, Let's think about first the domain. The domain is a circle, right? So the, the orthogonal group on R2 is a group of symmetries, symmetries for the domain, okay? So again, not for the, not for the vectors, for the domain here, okay? This is, this is the weird part. But it turns out that groups of symmetries for the domain are how we understand groups of symmetries for the original problem. Because the way that this group is going to act on functions is through the domain elements. Okay, so for example, if I have gamma, which is an element of O2, this implies that uh, sorry, gamma of u of theta is equal to u of gamma inverse of theta. Now, you're looking at that right away and you're thinking, what's with the inverse? Uh, again, if you know a little bit of group theory, this is to make uh, the action work properly, okay? Um, but essentially, we're saying that elements of O2 act on functions in these spaces by acting on their arguments, 
okay? And the reason we, did, we got away with this is because O2 is a group of symmetries for the space, right? So we can move stuff around in space using O2, then we can just say that O2 acts on the functions by moving around the space underneath. And the question is, how does this actually operate? Well, gamma inverse of theta would be theta minus gamma if gamma is a rotation. And gamma inverse of theta is equal to 2 pi minus theta if it's a reflection. Remember, O2 is made up of rotations and reflections. So here, let me draw a big circle so that we can understand what I'm trying to say here. Here's my big circle. Well, I can obviously uh, sort of take a point right here and I can push it forward by theta. Or let's look at a reflection. Then what this is, is it'll give me a point down here, which is just 2 pi minus theta, right? So it's just going all the way around, but not going up to theta. So these are two symmetries of the circle, and this is how they act on the circle. So what this means is that my symmetry group can act on any function in any of the CK spaces, right? Differentiability doesn't come into this. So give me any function from a K differentiable space, a space of K differentiable functions, I can act on it using this O2 representation, right? And I say representation very purposely. The entire, you know, the massive area of research into representation theory becomes extremely relevant here because we have to figure out how to represent groups acting on these spaces. A very, very complicated question uh, that I'm going to leave for better pure mathematicians. Now the question is, is gamma, or, or sorry, is P O2 equivariant, right? So let's see. If I take gamma in O2, I have this. Um, do I have mu? Yes. Which is what? It is the second derivative with respect to theta here. And then plus g of uh, gamma u mu. And the question is, does gamma come out of this? Well, let's take a look. If gamma is a rotation, right, based on this representation right here. So if gamma is a rotation, let's see what happens. Well, okay, then P of gamma u comma mu, this thing is a function of theta, which is, just like I just wrote right here, this is the second derivative with respect to theta of gamma u uh, at theta plus g of gamma u at theta comma mu which is equal to let's just write out this partial derivative um, u of theta minus gamma plus g of u of theta minus gamma so I'm just using the representation of the group here right so Gamma acts on u by gamma inverse theta. Gamma inverse theta is equal to gamma or theta minus gamma whenever I have a rotation. But actually, this derivative here is the same as this derivative. Now, this is going to really throw you for a loop. But derivatives, second derivatives, are translation independent. Now, you might have to really think about this. It took me a while to sort of get this down, but just use the chain rule. This is, this is very much true. Theta minus gamma mu. Which now I have all theta minus gammas here, which is just the same as P, uh, sorry, gamma P of U comma mu of theta. So, I get that this thing is equivariant with respect to the rotations. 
You can actually do the same thing for the flips. So the flips, uh, in this case, you know, same for, for reflections. And you saw that the critical step is right here. Really, the critical step for reflections comes from this fact. This is just partial and then partial, um, what is it, theta, uh, sorry, 2 pi minus theta squared. And this should be a, a partial, sorry. It's not very well drawn. Okay. So, you know, what made all of this work? Well, the key to all of this is that the second derivative is invariant. It doesn't matter if you translate it or reflect it with respect to um, uh, O2. So that's how we were able to show that this thing is equivariant. So basically, this operator, P, is equivariant with respect to O2. So what that means is that it has symmetries, right? So we can use a lot of the language and the tools. There are things like isotropy subgroups. There are fixed point spaces. They are all associated with these things. Solutions are mapped into each other by symmetries. And it turns out that like, things like the equivariant branching lemma exist for these types of partial differential equations. They're much more complicated, much harder to apply, but the basics are still there. Still looking for axial subgroups, all this kind of fun stuff. What I really want you to understand here is that the symmetries came from the symmetry of the space. If my space was not a circle, but a filled in square, right? So I can move anywhere in this two dimensional domain, then my symmetry group would be the dihedral group of order, uh, the, the D4 group, right? Or if my domain was, you know, a dodecahedron, my symmetry group would be D12. If my symmetry group was a line that didn't have identified endpoints, uh, like it was not periodic, then its only symmetry group would be flips. Okay? So what I really want you to understand here is that equivariance comes from the domain in partial differential equations. Now technically, if you have boundary conditions, you have to also have them corresponding to your to your um, symmetry group as well to respect these symmetries. Part of me using the, the periodic domain is I got away from using uh, boundary conditions. But now you can feel it, right? It's slipping out of control. It's really complicated. PDEs are always more complicated than ordinary differential equations. But the beauty of using reaction diffusion equations is that a lot of the theory, although slightly more difficult or more technical, can be ported over and we can use a lot of these results like the equivariant branching lemma. Okay, in the past three lectures, I've given you a complete crash course on an entire field of research that's, under, that's been under construction for 50 or so years, right? So you're certainly not an expert on this, but maybe you have a little bit of the techniques and the topics and the ideas sort of bubbling around in your head. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.